Well, good evening, my sisters and brothers. Good to have you along the ride again tonight. Uh, I got around seven o'clock or so on Monday night, so it's time again for the 10 and sevens to get together. Uh, happy Tuesday night to everybody uh, who has gathered around to watch it either live or watch it later on, um, you know, uh, less than live, I guess, or not live, I don't know what you would call that, but as a replay, maybe you would call it as a replay. Uh, again, like our last study, all the videos will be saved here on the Facebook page, also over on the YouTube channel. I've started another playlist on YouTube. I can't remember what I called it. I think I called it 10 and 7s or, no, no, I called it the week before Holy Week. That's what the one you want to look for. So if you miss any of the ones this week, go back to the week before Holy Week, and that's where you'll be able to find all the videos from this particular week. So tonight we're going to talk a little bit about uh, John chapter 7, verses 14 through 17. And as a supplement to that, we'll look at Acts chapter 18, uh, verse 24 through 38. Uh, the reason we're doing that is uh, I know one of the things that I've heard often from folks that you invite to come to church, you invite to be part of a group, a study group, I'll say, well, I don't know much about the Bible. And I think that there's this, um, I don't know, misconception that to be a, a confessing and believing Christian, you're supposed to know everything there is to know about Scripture or about the Bible or about the faith and have a you know, a, a, an acute knowledge of everything uh, that is uh, in Scripture. Uh, and so what we're going to read about tonight is we're going to find out that that's not, that's not entirely true. Uh, well, it's not true at all. Um, in fact, um, God just asks of us a little bit, right? And we get a little bit of, of learning in, in Scripture and what it means, and then we'll get a little bit hungrier, we'll want more, we'll want more, we'll want more, uh, until we get to the point to where when we use a little bit that we have, we see that we start to gain more and more and more and more. Because what is going to happen is that God's going to put people in our lives to instruct us and to teach us and to fill us and to mold us and to shape us. And we learn more each and every day as we as we go along. We'll talk about that here uh, in just a little bit. But before we get started, I want to uh, invite everybody to take a moment. Uh, let us bow our heads, close our eyes, and go to the Lord in prayer as we start our study tonight. Let us pray. Eternal God. You have been the hope and joy of many generations. And in all ages, you have given women and men the power to seek you and in seeking to find you. Grant me, I pray, a clearer vision of your truth, a greater faith in your power, and a more confident assurance of your love. When the way seems dark before me, give me grace to walk trustingly. When so much is obscure to me, may I be all the more faithful to the little I can clearly see. When the distant scene is clouded, may I rejoice that at last I can see the next step. When what you are is hidden from my eyes, let me hold fast to what you command. When I do not understand, may I remain obedient. What I lack in faith, may I make up for in love. O oh, infinite God, the brightness of your face is often covered from my human gaze. Thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to be a light in a dark world. O oh, Christ, you are the light of light. Thank you that in your most holy life you pierced the eternal mystery as with a great beam of heavenly light so that in seeing you we see the one whom no human being has ever seen. And if I still cannot find you, O oh God, then let me search my heart and know whether it is I am blind rather than you who are hidden, whether it is I who am running away from you rather than you from me. Help me to confess my sins before you and seek your forgiveness. In Jesus Christ, my Lord. Amen. All right, so our first reading tonight comes from uh, the Gospel according to John. This is the seventh chapter. Verses 14 through 17. Again, this is John chapter 7, verses 14 uh, through 17. Uh, roughly what has happened here is that Jesus has uh, appeared in Galilee. And he's hanging out with his family, truthfully, with his, with his brothers. Uh, and the Jewish festival of the booths is coming near. And so Jesus' brother says, we need to go into town and, and partake in this particular festival. Uh, but some of them don't believe that he is who he says he is. And so what they're encouraging Jesus to do is says, you need to go out during this festival of booths and work some of your miracles and show them some of your signs. Then they'll know that you are exactly who you claim to be. Because again, some of them didn't believe that he was uh, the son of God. But Jesus says that, you know, my time has not come yet. I'm not quite ready for that. So what ends up happening is the brothers go off to the festival of booths and Jesus also goes, but he kind of hides in the shadows and kind of sneaks around a little bit. 
But then he makes his way into the synagogue, or the temple rather, and he starts to teach. And that's where we kind of pick up our story here. It says, About the middle of the festival, Jesus went up into the temple and began to teach. The Jews were astonished at it, saying, How does this man have such learning when he has never been taught? Then Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. Anyone who resolves to do the will of God will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own. So again, Jesus goes to the temple and he starts teaching and all these learned scholars of the Jewish faith, these guys that know everything there is to know about the Jewish or Hebrew scriptures, wonders, well, how can Jesus possibly know what he knows? You know, effectively say, well, he was a, a you know, middle-class carpenter's son. He didn't have the money to go to school and learn all these things that, that we learn. How can he possibly know this kind of stuff. And so what Jesus is saying is that, well, this knowledge doesn't come necessarily from, from books or from being in the best schools. It comes from uh, what my Father gives to me, the, the faith gives to me. You know, God's pouring into me, my Father's pouring into me all of these, these things. Uh, the teaching is not mine, but is the one who sent me. Yeah? And so then Jesus says that anyone who resolves through the will of God will know whether the teaching is from God or whether speaking on their own. So again, it is what you look at as, as being true or being the truth coming from what you think or is it coming from what God says? And we, we, is, is what you think lined up with Scripture? And if what you say is line, does not line up with Scripture, then might I submit that what you're trying to pro pass off as the truth is just what you think. But it's not what God is giving you. It's not what God has given all of us uh, to use as our markers for the truth. And there's an interesting parallel to that story uh, over in the book of Acts, which is chapter... 18 verses 24 through 28. It's about a guy named Apollos. We've mentioned Apollos before in some of Paul's other writings. But here, listen to this story in, in Acts chapter 18, 24 through 27, or 24 through 28 rather. <clears throat> it says, Now there came to Ephesus a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria. He was an eloquent man, well versed in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord. Now back then, those who were part of the way were what we just referred to as Christians. They're the ones who followed the teachings of Jesus Christ. It says he was an eloquent man, well versed in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with burning enthusiasm and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained the way of God to him more accurately. These were two early followers of Jesus. And when he wished to cross over to Achaia, which is another town, the believers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. On his arrival, he greatly helped those who through grace had become believers, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Messiah is Jesus. So again, this story about Apollo shows that here was a man who was full of the Holy Spirit, full of the teachings of, of Jesus, even though he never met Jesus, all he had been was baptized by water like John the Baptist had been doing. But because he knew a little through the truth that was implanted in him through the Holy Spirit, he was able to learn a little bit more from the other followers of Jesus. Then learn a little bit more, learn a little bit more. Then go to the town, teach a little bit more, learn a little bit more. See, friends, we should always be about learning. We should never think that we know everything, that we got it all down pat. Each and every day for us should be a learning experience, particularly in the ways of our faith. So I want to read to you a little bit from our devotion on this particular chapter uh, from both John and Acts. It ties both of them together, I think. And the writer of the devotion says this. He says, The difficulty of finding out what is truth in religion is a common subject of complaint among men. They point to the many differences which prevail among Christians on matters of doctrine and profess to be unable to decide who is right. In thousands of cases, this professed inability to find out truth becomes an excuse for living without any religion at all. So what he's saying here roughly is you look out your door and you see a Baptist church, a Methodist church, an Anglican church, Presbyterian church, and some people might be inclined to say, well, they don't even know what's right, so I'm just not going to have any religion at all, right? But that's not the way we should be. We should each seek out our own uh, truth. Uh, the different things we, we disagree on, maybe as far as sprinkling baptism between full immersion baptism, you know, how often you take communion, these, these things are truly on the periphery. Right? They, don't, they don't deal with the hardcore truths and beliefs 
of Christianity. So that's why we can have subtle disagreements over those particular issues. It says, The saying of our Lord before us is one that demands the serious attention of persons in this state of mind. It supplies an argument whose edge and point they will find it hard to evade. It teaches that one secret of getting the key of knowledge is to practice honestly what we know, and that if we conscientiously use the light that we now have, we shall soon find more light coming down into our minds. In short, there is a sense in which it is true that by doing, we shall come to know. So what he's saying here is that if you've got a little bit of knowledge implanted inside of you, that you know to be the truth, which for us is going to be what? Our way to salvation is to repent and believe. We learned that in our Bible study of Luke. If you have that truth implanted in you, then by doing that, you're going to start to learn more and more and more about your faith. You know, when Jesus tells Nicodemus about needing to be born again, there's a metaphor there that all of us start as a baby in our faith journeys. But just as babies grow to be toddlers and adolescents and then preteens and teens and then adults, so is the same thing with our faith. We start as, as infants, but hopefully we continue to grow in our faith. You're not born perfected in the faith. You're born as a little baby, and you grow and grow and grow and grow. It says, there is a mine of truth in this principle. Well, would it be for men if they would act upon it? Instead of saying, as some do, I must first know everything clearly, and then I will act, we should say, I will diligently use such knowledge as I possess and believe that in the using fresh knowledge will be given to me. How many mysteries this simple plan would solve? How many hard things would soon become plain if men would honestly live up to their light and follow on to know the Lord? It should never be forgotten that God deals with us as moral beings and not as beasts or stones. He loves to encourage us to self-exertion and diligent use of that of, of such means as we have in our hands. The plain things in religion are undeniably very many. Let a man honestly attend to them, and he shall be taught the deep things of God. Let him humbly use what little knowledge he has got, and God will soon give him more. Here's an example of what he's talking about here. Back around, oh, I don't know, 2010 or so, back when entering ordained ministry was probably the furthest thing from my mind. I got a copy of this book called uh, My Utmost for His Highest. It's a daily devotional written by a guy named Oswald Chambers. And he doesn't, he doesn't hold back as far as what he says and how he says it. He uses you know, hardcore theological language. And so when I first got this book, because my mind truthfully was about as far away from God as maybe it should have been, I started reading it and I didn't get it. And it didn't make a lick of sense to me, right? So I put it away. Well, then about 2012, 2013, as I started feeling a call to get a little deeper into my faith, I took what little knowledge I had and started to read more devotionals and more books and took scripture and prayer more seriously. And so I went back to that book. Well, I looked at the book and opened it you know, the, at that time. It made a whole lot more sense, right? Because I had taken what little knowledge that I had and allowed it to grow. And through that growth, God was giving me more and more knowledge so that that book that made absolutely no sense three years before, now made a whole lot of sense, right? That's what's sometimes referred to as a form of progressive revelation. I don't mean progressive as far as we think is progressive or conservative or any of those political terms. I just mean the fact that it starts somewhere and then grows and grows and grows and grows. It progresses, again, just like our growth progresses. So what I want to encourage you to do is to wherever you are right now, if you have just come into the faith or if you have been a cradle Christian, every one of us has room to grow. Every one of us should be seeking knowledge. Take what you know now, the gifts that God has, has given you now as far as what you have learned and what you know to be true in, record, in, in regards to Scripture. Let that be your starting point and then grow from there, right? And what you'll notice is that as you continue to grow in your faith and you allow the Holy Spirit to fill you, you're going to be filled to the point of overflowing. We talked about this last week as well. And as you're filled to the point of overflowing, that's where you get out to be in service to your fellow man, right? That's when you really start to find yourself falling in love with Jesus Christ, which is a position we all aspire to be in. So don't be ashamed. Don't be worried. Don't take for granted what you do know right now to be true as far as your faith journey is concerned. Everybody has to start somewhere. 
right? But from that point, allow yourself to grow. And don't beat yourself up if you don't get it right away or don't understand something or you have a question about something. I mean, truthfully, that's what I'm here for. If you got a question, you got a concern, you're confused about something, let me know. And you and I will walk it together to try to make it a little, make it, make a little more sense to you. Now, truthfully, I don't know everything. Not everything in Scripture makes 100% crystal clear sense to me either. But I think a part of that is what faith is, right? Faith is something that you can't see and maybe can't possibly know for sure. Because as Scripture tells us, God's thoughts are not our thoughts and God's words are not our words. God's ways are not our ways. There are some things I think we're just not supposed to know. And so we make the joke that, well, we'll just ask God when we get to heaven, which truthfully, when we get to heaven, asking God questions is going to be the last thing on our, on our hearts and minds. So don't be ashamed of where you are. Don't be worried about where you are. Start where you are and then move forward day after day after day. And you say, well, how do I move forward day after day after day? Well, watching this is one of those ways, truthfully. But so is reading scripture every day. So is praying every day, doing a devotion every day, trying to find some way to worship. Um, I know most of us now have to be online, but finding an online worship uh, service to watch. There's plenty of ways for us to grow uh, our faith. Another important way, ask questions. Find yourself an accountability partner or two, right? Get together with two or three people and devote yourselves to, you know, let's read scripture at the same time every day. Let's pray together at the same time every day and hold each other account. And then ask each other questions about what you read or what you prayed about. And then what you'll notice is that you start to grow and grow and grow in your faith so that, like it says here, when you use the little that you have, you gain more, right? And that should be the goal for all of us. All right, my friends, so that's about it for tonight. I want to, as we close, uh, just remind you again that this video, the one we did this morning, is going to be saved on this page, also on the YouTube channel. Um, see if you can find the post I made last night about where we're going over the next week or so. I put links to the different resources that I'm going to be using as we travel together uh, these next two weeks. Uh, but we'll be back at it again tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock and tomorrow evening at 7 now, tomorrow's at 10 o'clock might be a little bit uh, expedited because I have an online doctor's appointment at 1030. So I might have to kind of pick something that's, um, I don't know, a little shorter or so. But I'll make up for it tomorrow evening, I promise. Uh, but having said all that, I um, hope you guys have a wonderful night. And I would wonder if you might want to join me as we close together in a time of prayer. Let us pray. Oh, unapproachable light. How can I raise these guilty hands to you? How can I pray to you with lips that have spoken hollow and grumpy words? A heart hardened with vindictive passions, an unruly tongue, an irritable nature, an unwillingness to bear the burdens of others, an undue willingness to let others bear my burdens, exaggerated boasting about small achievements, fine words hiding unworthy thoughts, a friendly face masking a cold heart, many neglected opportunities and many undeveloped talents, much love and beauty unappreciated and many blessings unacknowledged. All these I confess to you, O God. Thank you, O loving Father, that holy and transcendent as you are, you have always shown yourself to be accessible to the prayers of sinful people like me. Especially I praise your name that in the gospel of Jesus Christ you have opened up a new and living way into your presence, making your mercy free to all who have nothing else to plead. Let me now find peace in my heart by turning away from myself and taking refuge in you. Let my despair over my miserable sins give way to joy in your adorable goodness. Let depression of mind make way for a renewed energy and a serving spirit. So let me lie down tonight thinking not of myself and my own concerns or of my hopes and fears or even of the ways in which I have offended you, but of others who need your help and of the work that I can do for their sakes in the vineyard of your world. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, my friends, hope you have a wonderful evening. Hope you rest well, and I'll see you back here tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. God bless.